Would you pray with me, church family? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. And as we have just taken the last uh, 10 to 15 minutes to do, we praise your great name. Uh, you indeed are worthy to be praised. Everything in creation, the only right response is to praise you. And so as your people who have been transformed by your love and by your grace, and we have been uh, beneficiaries of your mercy through the coming of your son, whom we are remembering every single day, but this week it's marked in our minds and it's marked in our hearts as he came and he walked and he lived. And even today, as we remember the triumphal entry, uh, the rejection of his own people, yet the fulfillment of prophecy and the heading to the cross, which we will celebrate and remember and reflect on over the next seven days. We thank you. We thank you for your love. And we just want to praise you today. And so help us to be a people that do that well. Help us in the valley to do that well. Help every true Bible church and biblical church to do that well. May the name of Christ be exalted, not only today, but this next week. For the fame, honor, and glory of your great name. And as we turn to your word this morning, we ask and pray that you would help us to understand it to be gripped by it, to be changed by it, and to be transformed from one degree of glory to the next. For that is the reason why you have called us unto yourself through your son, so that we may be made like him. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church family. How are you doing? Good. Uh, good morning for everyone that's watching online. Um, I know there's some people that are not here. I can look around the room and see that we have some empty seats today. So my assumption is that you're not feeling well and you're having sick kids and you're not skipping out because you're obligated to be here next week. But if that's where you are, we're praying for you, okay? But we miss you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week as we celebrate our risen king together. Uh, church family, it's good to be with you. Guests, if they're you're with us, and this is your first time. We're glad that you're here with us today. We don't know what got you here. We don't know what brought you here, whether it's the sign, whether it's looking up on Yelp or online somewhere, but we're just glad that you're here. We want you to know that we've been praying for you, and it is our hope and prayer, as Pastor Nate said a moment ago, uh, that you would feel loved, you would feel hospitality, and you would feel welcomed, and Lord willing, if it is his will, that this could be possibly for you, your church home. And so if there's any way that we can serve you, we would love to do that at the end of the service. Find myself, Pastor Nate. Go to the Welcome Center, the One Stop. We have a bunch of different environments where you can get your questions answered. And so be sure uh, to do that. Well, if you grab your copy of God's Word with me, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. If you need a copy of God's Word, whether you forgot it or you're new to church, these men can get you a copy. Just raise your hand. That is our gift to you. Ephesians chapter 6 is where we will be in God's Word this morning. And in a moment, we will begin to unpack that. Uh, but... As we turn to his word this morning, we are continuing uh, in a series titled Blueprint, uh, looking at God's design for the family. This is the fourth week and the final week. And really, as pastors, uh, we knew at some point that we would need to hit pause on uh, our Gospel of John study and to jump into this mini series in light of what the Lord has been doing at our church over the past couple of years and how he's grown us spiritually and also numerically. And one of the realities that's come with that, uh, we have a lot more kids and a lot younger families. And so we knew at some point we would need to lock in on the family and the theme of the family, unpack what God's word has to say about that. And it was about two months ago, uh, we were in a car and we were driving, just talking about different things. And we really felt like the time was now. And so that's really where the series was birthed out of. And so uh, really over the past four weeks, we've been locking into the theme of the family seeking to be sanctified under God's word as a result together as a church. See, the reality is there's no shortage of opinions on the family today. I've said this multiple times. Uh, you can go to people not only inside of the church, outside of the church. You can go from pew to pew, from congregation to congregation, and you're going to find opinions galore. Uh, you can go to bookstores that are secular, and you can go to bookstores that are, in quote, Christian, and you will find opinions upon opinions. you got different forms and philosophy of the family, 
And there are many different thoughts about it. And this is where we as the people of God in the midst of all of the confusion need to do what God's people have always done, which is return to the true source of wisdom, which is the word of God. And so that's what we've done over the past four weeks. We've looked at God's word regarding a wife. We've looked at God's word regarding a husband. We've looked at God's word regarding children. And as we turn to his word this morning, we're going to look at God's word regarding fathers. And you could even say in parentheses, parents. There's a presupposition that I believe all of us are aware of this morning. I'm assuming every single one of us hold it. And the presupposition is this, that parents are vital to the raising and to the rearing and to the upbringing of kids to be productive members in society. Does everybody hold to that? I think everyone does, right? That's a presupposition that we all hold to. To state it another way, parents are a major shaping influence in the life of their kids. Now, their shaping influence can be for the negative or for the positive, but they're a shaping influence nonetheless. Uh, this was highlighted by a survey I recently came across done by the Houston Police Department. In fact, after doing this survey, they compiled it together and put it under the title, How to Ruin Your Child, and handed it out. Let me give you the five principles that they highlighted. And don't raise your hand if any of these are true for you in your household, but five principles. Number one, begin with infancy to give the child everything he wants. Principle number two. When he picks up bad words, simply just laugh at him. Principle number three, never give him any spiritual training. I find this one very interesting because it's coming from a secular institution. Never give him any spiritual training. Let him wait until he's 21 years old and then let him decide for himself. Number four, avoid using the word wrong. It may develop a serious guilt complex. Number five, pick up everything he leaves lying around. So he will be experienced in throwing responsibility on everyone else. Five principles, how to ruin your child. According to the Houston Police Department, they determined it to be 90% accurate when it comes to future delinquency. Let me give you another study I came across recently by Eleanor Gluck of Harvard University that aimed to really identify the common factors in juvenile delinquency. In this, they developed a lot of different principles that were able to predict with 90% accuracy from age five to six, a child that would go on to be delinquent. Here are the four things that they highlighted. They said, these things must be present to prevent that in most scenarios and cases. Number one, a discipline must be firm, fair, and consistent. Number two, a parent must know where his or her child is and what they are doing at all times and be with them as much as possible. Number three, children, my, my, my kids have loved this one a little bit more as I sought to implement this one. Children need to see love demonstrated between the father and the mother and see genuine love lived out before them. I love, kids love when I kiss Allie in the kitchen when she's making dinner. Number four, a family must be cohesive, regularly spending time together. Now, there are many more surveys that we can go to that highlight really the same thing. These are common things that are going to help position a kid and prep a kid to be a productive, in quote, citizen in society. Parents play a vital role. But as we turn to God's word, what we must recognize is that this isn't just true on a sociological scale. This is true on a spiritual scale as well. And that's what Paul highlights with where he takes us next in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And so with your uh, copies of God's word, turn to Ephesians 6, 4. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? We're going to study verse 4, but I'm going to read verse 1 through 4 to give us context and simply follow along as I read out loud. The verses will be on the side screen. If you do not have your copy of God's word, turn to it yet. But Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, follow along as I read God's word. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And then verse 4, the portion of scripture that we're going to lock into this morning. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up, rear them up, in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. These are the words of the living God. We could be seated as we seek to understand them this morning. Let me give you the title for the sermon. 
The title for the sermon is A Father's Discipleship. A Father's Discipleship. And if I were to sum up what I believe we're going to see here in this specific verse, verse 4, let me give you what I call the take-home truth as a summary statement. It'll be on the side screens. God's design for the home includes a father who leads in discipling his kids. A God's design for the home includes a father who leads in discipling his kids. In our study of God's word this morning, I simply want to show you and highlight and pull out from the text two marks, two distinguishing marks of a discipling father. If you have the notes from your bulletin, you'll notice that there are three. Uh, I pulled one out, and so there's only going to be two this morning. So two marks of a discipling father. The reality is these things must be true of a father who is seeking to disciple his kids in a God-honoring way. And as we're going to discuss in a moment, this should also be true of mom as well. But Paul does highlight the fathers. And so point number one, first mark is that the discipling father does not provoke his children. Does not provoke his children. Very, very important. Look at verse four with me. Fathers. Uh, Paul's utilizing the same pattern that he has recently done with a wife and a husband. In fact, if you were to look at it in Ephesians chapter five, he he starts with the one who is to place himself under the authority and the care of another. He did that with the wives when he says, willingly subject yourself to your husband. And then he shifts over to the one who's responsible with the stewardship of the one who has willingly subjected themselves under their care. So he shifts over to the husband. Well, he did the same thing here. He started with children, obey your parents in the Lord. And he continues the same pattern by shifting over to the father's. Now, it's worth noting that the word here for fathers is the word pater. Pater, this can be translated into the English term parents. We do see this translated this way in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. But despite that one usage of the term translated into the term parent, by and large, this word carries the, the force of pointing to the male parent within a family. And really, I think that we can draw that this is the right interpretation of this word from the context, because if we go back to Ephesians chapter five or six, rather six, one, uh, Paul tells children to obey what? Obey your parents. That is a different Greek word. And so for Paul to bring a different Greek word as he's talking about parents, Ephesians six, four, and not use the word he used in Ephesians six, one through three, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So with many scholars, I conclude as well that this is a good translation of the term. Now, with that being said, we would be hard pressed to say that what is said here should not apply to moms. This is to be true of dad. Dad is to lead out in this. But moms, do not check out. This sermon is for you as well. This should be true of you. Now, as we affirm that and we say that, what we also have to be careful of is blunting the sharpness of the scalpel that God does intend to hit the conscience of the fathers in the congregation, though. We got to be careful not to blunt it. And so while it does apply to both mom and dad, God does single out the fathers in the room. And with the father's ears perked up, their minds attentive, Paul goes on to say next, do not... If you want to draw it to your margin, say this is the negative command, negative command. Do not provoke your children to anger. To provoke is to parent in such a way where you're drawing out of their hearts resentment and anger and hostility. You're exasperating them where they respond towards you with those things rather than love and warmth and affection and obedience as outlined in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. This is an anger that arises in response to a father's unfair and unreasonable and sometimes even ungodly parenting. Paul says something similar in Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. He says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. 
so that they will not lose heart, so that they will not become discouraged. See, provoking our children to anger, exasperating our children is driving at the same idea of provoking a response in them that is hardening their hearts rather than softening their hearts to us, the truth, to the church, to Christ, and to God. Now, why does Paul tell the fathers this? Why does he single out the dads? Well, this applies to both mom and dad. Why does he single out the fathers? Well, a father's role in the home makes him particularly susceptible to the great danger of misusing his authority. The role of being the head, the role of being the one um, whom is the father and the children are to, to follow and the role of taking the lead as the one who is to lead in disciplining and instruction, instructing, it makes them particularly susceptible to abusing their authority. Or to put it another way, causing more damage than good. And brothers, if I'm just being honest with you, this is my greatest fear as a father. If I just put my cards on the table, every time I come to this portion of scripture, it beats me up. Every time I study this portion, it does work on me because it reminds me how delicate the heart of a child is. I mean, this portion right here, this command right here is really what causes consternation within my soul at times as I examine even my parenting at times. It reminds me of how delicate and how important and how tender we must be with our kids. So what are some ways that we can be guilty of exasperating our children? It wasn't too long that I did preach this sermon, but I have different applications this week because some of these may be marked down in your side notes, but I've got 10 things. Fathers, I would encourage you to write them down. Moms, I'd encourage you to write them down as well. Uh, number one, one of the ways that we provoke our children to anger or exasperate them is by having favorites. How many of you guys know how that turned out in the Bible, right? That didn't turn out too well. Having favorites. We say on the surface that we love all of our children, but it's very clear that one of our children is preferred. And the other kids feel it. Number two, overprotecting them. Um, some of you guys are helicopter parents. And that's a good thing in many ways. But if we never let our kids fail, if we never let our kids venture out, especially boys, then we can kind of shelter them to the spot where we actually build up resentment. And the moment that they get freedom, guess what? They book it for the door and they run. Overprotecting them is a way that we can provoke them to anger. Number three, this one's very important, not recognizing their uniqueness. How many of us have been guilty of saying in our heart, man, I just wish my son was like so-and-so's son? And none of us would say that out verbally, but how many of us have said that in our heart or we've said that to our spouse? We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't recognize how God has wired our children not only with other children outside of our home, but even amongst in the, the kids in our home. Every one of them are different. Every one of them are unique. Every one of them have their own skill set. Every one of them have their strengths and their own weaknesses. And it's important as a father and as parents for us to do the hard work of recognizing how God has wired our children and not viewing them as carbon copies of one another. You see, if you do that with your first child onto your second and onto your third, expecting them all to respond and all to listen and all to uh, do things the same way, you're going to exasperate some of them. You're going to provoke them to anger. Number four, neglecting them. Neglecting them. Um, we don't turn the TV off or we don't do the hard work of going into the bedroom at night and spending time with them. Uh, guys, I know it. We're, we're tired at the end of the day. Uh, we, we've had a long day's work. We've had somebody chew us out in the office. Our boss is threatening us. We got cut off on the freeway heading home. I mean, on and on and on. You get to your house and you're just depleted. And you have no energy. But that's the time when we got to give our best. That's the time where we've got to lock in. That's the time where we can't skimp out. And I stand up here not as one who's got it figured out. These are things I'm working out in my own heart and my life as well. We can't neglect them. They feel that. They'll know that. They'll recognize that they're not the most important in our life. That'll exasperate them. That'll provoke them to anger. Number five, 
This one I'm particularly guilty of. Expecting perfection. Expecting perfection. You know what perfectionists do? They minimize the praises and they make a bigger deal out of the mess ups. I've been guilty of that. And I've seen my kids, when I do that, cower in that moment. They do something positive, and it's good. They hit the mark. But then for some reason, because of my perfectionistic mentality, I I diminish that. Setting unreasonable expectations, setting too high of a bar, demanding from them something that at their age, they honestly just won't hit. That's a way to exasperate and to provoke our children to anger. Number six, being critical of everything that they do. Uh, Nitpicking everything. Number seven, humiliating them. Uh, Number eight, this one's important, disciplining with arbitrariness. Not having a standard, not having a... Coming into the bathroom and being angry, having the rod, and instead of giving them a proportionate amount of chastisement in a God-honoring way, you use this as a venting session, and you give them way more chastisement than they're supposed to receive. Bordering on abuse. Disciplining in an arbitrary type of manner. That'll provoke your children to anger. That'll harden their hearts towards you. Number 10. Comparing them, and I've already highlighted this, with other children. Now, if you're like me, which I assume the majority of us are, especially as husbands and as fathers, you have blind spots. You have blind spots. And so oftentimes we can think we're nailing it, right? We're crushing it. But oftentimes there are things that we're doing that we don't even recognize. And so as a way of application, let me just give you two things to be considering and thinking about as a father when it comes to this reality of not provoking our children to anger. Number one, ask God to reveal if there's any way that you're doing it. And he will reveal. He'll give you, he'll give you an impression. He'll give you wisdom. He'll give you discernment, rather, which is a better word, a discernment to be able to see, yeah, I, I saw what just happened right there. Ask God to reveal. Number two, ask your wife to give you insight as well. Ask your wife. Next date night, sit down and say, hey, honey, I want to be a good dad. I think I'm doing good in these areas, but are there any blind spots? Is there a way where I'm talking in my tone? Or is there a way in where I'm not affirming enough? Is there a way where I'm neglecting time with them? Is there a way, or is there something that I'm unaware of that's actually provoking our kids to anger? You're seeing them walk away with their heads downcast and their hearts hardening towards me and towards truth. Is there something I just need to be aware of? Ask your wife to give you insight. And then thirdly, Ask the Lord for strength. Ask the Lord for wisdom. Lord, help me. Help me in this area. Help me with this sin issue. Help me with this deficiency in my job as a parent to be better. Go to the word. Interface it with what the word of God says. Memorize those truths and plead with God to change you from the heart level. All the while looking to your heavenly father as the perfect example. Paul says, if a man's going to be a God-honoring father, then he must be actively engaged in not provoking his children to anger. That's the negative command. Now he gives the positive. Point number two, he intentionally nourishes his kids spiritually. I know that's not the most homiletically pleasing phraseology, but it's the best I could come up with. Intentionally nourishes his kids spiritually spiritually. Let's look at verse six again. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The word but right there in the beginning or the middle of verse four signals a contrast with Paul's uses of this word. He's saying, hey, the first is don't do this. Now I want you to do This Don't harden their hearts. Don't provoke them to anger. Rather, bring them up. Now, what does he mean by bring them up? 
This is a phrase that speaks to raising up, to nurturing, to nourishing something to maturity. In fact, if you were to look up at Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, when Paul is giving instructions to a husband, to his wife, he uses this same term. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, verse 29, for no one ever hated his own flesh, and then there's our term, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. So what's something we should be thinking about when we consider this idea of bringing our kids up and this idea of nourishing them? Are there a couple of implications for us as fathers more practically? There are two that come to mind for me. Number one, this is a tender, tender activity. Very important. This is a tender activity activity. See, whether it be a plant in the garden, a husband nourishing and cherishing his wife as Ephesians 5, or as is the case here with the father bringing up their children, all of these scenarios speak to a tender engagement between the parties. I love the fact that John Calvin translates this phrase this way. He says, let them be kindly cherished, kindly cherished. Now, this is very important for fathers to hear because between a husband and a wife, a a mom and a dad, the father tends to be the less tender one by and large, right? The father tends to be the one who thinks in box categories or job description categories, all or nothing categories. I told you to do this. Why didn't it get done? Never mind the kid. Maybe he stepped on a Lego and his foot's bleeding. I told you to take out the trash. Why is the trash still sitting there? And mom comes over and loves them and cares for them and wipes off the blood and bandages them up. See, we as dads, we tend to be less tender. Like we need this right here. We've got to recognize that just like a plant has to be engaged with a tender mentality, so do our children. Number two. This is not a passive activity. This is not a passive activity. I love the way that Martin Lloyd-Jones, by far my favorite preacher, he said it this way. He says, if parents but give as much thought to the rearing of their children as they do the rearing of animals and flowers, the situation would be very different. This is not passive. There's nothing passive about what God is calling us to hear. See, I don't have a green thumb. In fact, I was writing my notes and I was going to say along the lines, I don't have a green thumb, I have a black thumb, but I felt like that wouldn't go across too well. (laughs) I don't have a green thumb. I kill everything typically. Okay? Some of you guys have green thumbs and you have it, and you know you have it by experience. Uh, You know that with that plant or that, that fruit or that vegetable or that flower, you know what it takes to bring that thing to its end, to see it blossom the way that it's supposed to blossom, to see it bring forth vibrant, colorful, tasty fruit the way that it's supposed to bring it forth, or for it to give off that fragrance that it's supposed to give off when you bought it in infancy stage and you knew this was going to be a three to four year journey. You know what what it takes to get there. You till the soil. You feed it the right food. You plant it with the right amount of sun so that it gets the nutrients it needs. You remove the specific bugs that need to be removed while leaving certain ones because you know it's actually good. You tie certain aspects of the plant up. There is nothing unintentional. There is nothing passive about that. And Paul's saying, parents, it is the same thing with kids. Fathers, there cannot be any passivity when it comes to this. But this is the key. In all of those scenarios, we're aiming for natural fruit, physical fruit. But in this engagement, what are we aiming for? Spiritual fruit. We're aiming for fruit that is pleasing to God. We're aiming for fruit that is a result of God's work in their lives and giving them a new nature. We're aiming for a fruit of a different character. 
And we see this as we begin to wind down the text in Ephesians 6, 4 with where Paul goes next. He says, but bring them up, nourish them, nurture them tenderly and actively. And then look at how he says it. He gives us the manner in which this is to be done in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Two things in the discipline of the Lord. What does Paul mean by the term discipline? What's the emphasis here in relation to the word instruction? Because it's clear that these are close together, closely tied, but they are unique. What's the difference? Well, there's five ways that this word or five references to this word discipline in the New Testament in its noun form. Let me read them off to you. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. And here's our term for training, and catch this, in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. You go over to Hebrews chapter 12, you've got the word discipline many more times than three. There's three uses of the same noun form, but the word in different forms, verb in different noun forms is used all throughout. But see if we can figure out the emphasis here. Hebrews 12 verse 5, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline, there's our word, of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, that's the verb form, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Verse 7, it is for discipline, there's the verb form again, that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? It's a verb again, verse 8. But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Verse nine, furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much more rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time. It seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good. And then here's the key again, so that we may share in his holiness. Verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So in light of these verses, what's the emphasis? What's the thrust of the word discipline here? The thrust is, and the emphasis is on the action of a parent. You see, the goal is training in righteousness, pointing them in the right direction, seeing their character transformed, seeing their, their will subdued in a God-honoring way. But the emphasis with this word is for that to be done in conjunction with training or action. To imagine what I mean and what I'm saying by this in a real-life scenario, this would be the difference between a parent saying, God wants you to be a good steward of your money, and then shifting over to God wants you to be a good steward of your money. Thus, I bought you this piggy bank and we're going to go to the bank with your weekly allowance. And I'm going to show you how to divide up your money. This is to God. This is for savings. And this is play money. You, you catch the emphasis? It, 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 it's, the, it's the training with action. Another way to think about it is children, obey your parents for this is the Lord's will. Okay, but when your son disobeys, not only are you saying it, God wants you to obey mommy and daddy, but you're coupling it with, even in this context, physical chastisement as Proverbs highlights as a training element. In fact, Proverbs 29.15 says that the rod and reproof give wisdom. A child who gets his way, it goes on to say, brings shame to his mother. The emphasis is on the action, the training, the physical things you're doing, not just chastisement, but uh, the, the ways you're seeking to form the character by bringing different things to the table. So that's discipline. Let's go to number two, in the instruction of the Lord. The word instruction means to, and I love this, put into the mind, put into the mind. This word is used three times in the New Testament, along with its usage, usage here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, speaking of Israel and how they are an example to us as New Testament saints, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now these things happen to them as an example 
and they are written for our instruction. What happened with Israel has been chronicled for us so that it would be put into our mind on what to do and what not to do. Titus chapter 3, verse 10, it says, reject a factious man after a first and second warning, after you put a warning into their, their mind. So what we see right here, based upon these verses, is that this word speaks primarily to what? Verbal instruction. Verbal instruction. This is what a father says to influence, and a mom says to influence the beliefs of their child. The words of a father can come in the form of teaching and encouraging and even warning from the scriptures. This is the aspect of parenting that focuses on forming a child's worldview. This is the aspect of parenting that centers upon the constant communication of the word of God and bringing it to bear upon the hearts of his children. This is very important for us to understand. In fact, I agree with Albert Barnes and what he says in his commentary, he says, if a man does not teach his children truth, others will teach him error. This is the instruction. This is the, the putting into the mind truth that our kids need to know. Who is the primary teacher for your children? Fathers. Is it the TV? Is it the kids at the playground? Let's even think about it a different way. Is it, is it the people that are serving right now? Are they the primary teacher? See, the Bible says you are and parents are to be the ones who are instructing, putting into the mind their children truths found in God's word. And notice the emphasis. He describes this as being done of the Lord. This means that all that we do to nurture and to raise our kids through discipline and instruction is rooted in God's word it is the outworking of God's will, and it is to be done in alignment with Christ himself. So what are some ways that we could think about applying this? Let me give you two. One I gave last week, and I won't camp on it. Uh, there are a lot of different classes. There are a lot of different resources. One that I um, and many have taken that has been a blessing to our home is the Training Hearts for Jesus course. And the reason why this course is a blessing is not only does it help you from the teaching your kids to obey, it starts with the parents and it starts with mom and dad's heart. And it starts with your walk with the Lord so that what you are doing is in fact pleasing to the Lord. And so this is a 14 week class. It's starting May 2nd. I would encourage you if you've yet to take it. I know some people are going to take it again. I would sign up for the class. You can do that at the one stop or sign up on the bulletin. But let me give you number two. Number two. This one's more important. Uh, I believe for many of us in the room. Number two, establish God as the center of all of life. When we're talking about bringing our kids up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord, we need to establish God as the center of all of our life. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 6. I want to show you this by way of illustration using an Old Testament text, really one of the most known Old Testament texts, often referred to as the Shema. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 6. Specifically, I want to look at verse 4 through 9. It's a passage that many of us are familiar with. And within this passage, there is a call towards loving and living out God's word in such a way where it actually has an impact upon the next generation. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. <clears throat> it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your, your might. Notice where it starts. It starts really with the adults. You shall love the Lord your God with everything you have. You see, if God's going to be the center of all of life, you have to have a vibrant relationship with the living God. If you are going to bring your kids up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord, this has to be an overflow of who you are. You must love God with everything you have. And then look at what it says in verse six. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently. 
to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. If we're to bring our kids up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord, then our lives must be centered around and rooted in God in everything. There cannot be any secular, sacred divide. Sundays for church, midweek life group is for church, but the rest of the week, I'm kind of just going to do whatever I want. No, God must be the anchor point, the fixed point for everything at the dinner table. When you wake up, when you get in the car, when you're shopping, when you're in the neighborhood, when you're at the park, we bring God into everything. We infuse God and his word and his will and his purposes into every circumstance of life. You see, the only way that this is really going to happen is if men, we are men of the word. Sometimes it seems like a like a simple and cheap application. But the reality is that is the application. I could give you 10 tips on how to bring your kids up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. But guess what's going to happen after a month when you lose perseverance? You're going to try to do it in your own strength. And when you do it in your own strength, guess what? Everybody can sense it. Everybody can feel it. Everybody can taste it. Everybody knows it. They know you're forcing it. You see, what we must be is we must be men that are marked by the word of God and a love for God and his truth is rattling in the bones of our our soul. And from that, there is an overflow into our kids. There is an overflow into our homes. There is an overflow into our wives. That's the only way you're going to have longevity in this. That's the only way you're going to bring your kids up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. I don't know how many of you guys are tradesmen, but back in the day when they used to do trades, it's a lot different than what they do now. Uh, You typically go to a school and you pay $60,000 to learn how to be a plumber or something of that like. That's typically how trades work today. But back in the day, you would often move in with the guy that you were learning from. And you would watch his every move, not only on the job, but off the job. Uh, You would be so steeped in what he did so that you would be marked by him and you would become just as good as him, if not better. That's the picture I think about when it comes to bringing our kids up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You see, the reality is they're in our homes. They're with us the majority of the week. The question is, will they, just like a person who's wanting to learn a trade, be able to observe us and actually imitate us and follow us and employ what we do, and will that be an act of us actually fulfilling, bringing them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord? If we're filled with the word of God, it will be. But if we're not, it won't. We've got to establish God as the center of all of life. Some of you guys say, how do you do that? How do you do that? See, the worst thing you can do is walk away from this and try to do it in your own strength. But the beautiful thing about what Jesus came to do 2,000 years ago is he died to redeem us from the penalty of sin, but he also died to redeem us from the slavery of sin. And so what that means is you and I don't have to actually give in to the temptations and the allurements of the flesh. We can actually turn to him and ask for his strength and walk by his spirit and find victory in this specific area. And so turn to Christ. This isn't a turning in salvation. This is a turning afresh saying, Lord, help me. Help me. Help me to be and help me to live out what you have called me to be as a father. See, blueprints are important, are they not? They're necessary for all types of things that we build. Things that possess earthly value. But when it comes to the family, which is far more valuable to God, Blueprints are all the more important. It is my hope and it is our prayer that over the past four weeks as we have studied, all of us have been reminded of God's blueprint for the home. And as a result, whether we're at the fourth quarter of our life, we would find truth in here 
to carry us on for the next 15 years or until the Lord calls us home. Or whether we're in the first quarter or second quarter of our life and we're newlyweds, that we would find truth in here that would mark us from society in such a way that we can be a shining bright light. There's truth in here for all of us. And so my hope and my prayer is that as a result of this series, our church would be filled with homes that are rooted in God's design and are positioned to give him glory. God's design for the home includes a father who leads in discipling his kids. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It is perfect. It restores the soul. Uh, your word is sure. It makes wise the simple. We thank you for the fact that we can turn to it not only on Sundays, but anytime, whether it be in the morning, at night, or on a break, and we can find nourishment for our soul. And so please make us a people who live not by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Help us to be a people who not only hear your word, but we live out your word. We apply it, for we know that it is in the application, enabled by grace, prompted by the Spirit's working, that not only are we conformed to your image, but really the second half of Ephesians, which our portion of Scripture has been locked into, we will walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we have received. And so help us to be a people who do that in light of what we studied this morning. Strengthen homes, sanctify homes, strengthen marriages, purify them, give them a greater bond of unity and love. And as a result, make our church more holy, make our church more purified, make our church more useful to your mission and purposes in this fallen world. We love you, Lord. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen.